Here is neuroscientist and MAP Habit co-founder, Dr. Stuart Sola. Well, hello again. It's Stuart Zola, and uh, we're here today to talk about several things at once. I'm going to just share my screen, and we'll uh, get the slides up so that we can you can see them. Um, let me just start this, then, and there we go. All right. So as you can see, we're going to talk about three things at least. One is salt one is sugar and one is alcohol. It turns out they are related in various ways, but we're asking the same question of each of them. How much is good for us? How much is not so good for us? And how much is hype? A lot of things that we hear about for each of these three substances um, may not be quite accurate. And so we'll try and clear that up during the course of the session as well. We're in for some treat and some fun. As you know, this is the way we usually do it. We're not taking these things too seriously, but we wanna make sure that we provide accurate information. So this is the kind of first slide that we'll look at because it provides us a framework that brings all of these three areas together. And what you see here are this uh, kind of um, yellowish big curve or even the brown smaller curve. Um, these are referred to as inverted U-shaped functions. Just a U stood on its head, essentially. And it turns out these are very useful for being able to describe uh, different aspects and utility of a particular topic or a particular idea, or in this case, a particular substance. For example, you see on the horizontal line, advice. And there could be some numbers on that horizontal line as well. But then when you look uh, above on the curves themselves, you'll see that there's an optimal level of advice. So if you're providing advice to somebody, often it is, as you know, you have to be a little bit careful about how much advice or how forceful the advice is. So there's an optimal level of the way you do that. If you are over here in the lower end of the curve on the left-hand side, then the effect is suboptimal. It has some impact, but not as much as you would hope it has. And if you go a little bit overboard in your advice, as happens with us uh, all sometimes, um, then you kind of have an excessive uh, sense of it from the other person and their, your advice is not taken then either. So you really have to find that balance in between advice that is not very useful and advice that is overly useful in a sense and accordingly ignored. And that's the idea of this inverted U-shaped curve um, for all kinds of things, whether it's the amount of alcohol we intake, whether it's the amount of sugar we intake, the amount of salt we intake, we're going to see that those things can all fit on this kind of curve. And there'll be some optimal levels, and then there'll be suboptimal, and in fact, in some cases, harmful levels over on the right-hand side. All right, so that's the general framework that we'll take. You'll see often in the slides that we frame the optimal level. This is the range of uh, the optimal level. There'll be different numbers on the horizontal axis that kind of bracket where the optimal level is. And we'll try to make that clear uh, as we go along. We're gonna start talking about salt. Salt uh, is sodium chloride. It's really two ingredients. It's 40% sodium and about 60% chloride. It's commonly used to season food and to increase flavor. It does really help enhance flavors. It's also used as a preservative. It helps preserve things. Um, it stops the growth of bacteria. And in 
organisms that helps regulate fluid balance as well. It's gained a kind of bad reputation because it's linked to a number of medical conditions. And, oh, I see, speaking of bad reputations, this is actually the wrong picture here. Let me just change that. There we go. Yeah, that was, by the way, let me go back to that. This picture of uh, Angela Jolie, the movie is called Salt. Um, and it is a great kind of adventure movie, if you like that kind of movie. Um, it's an old movie, um, but it was a well-done movie. So uh, you may want to take a look at that. But um, sorry, this picture of salt is the wrong picture of salt. This is the salt picture that should be there. And as I mentioned, it's gained a kind of bad reputation because it's linked to many medical conditions, things like high blood pressure, uh, aspects of heart disease, possibly some uh, association and link with certain stomach cancers. Sodium is involved in muscle contractions, um, and its loss can contribute to muscle cramps and to low levels of chloride can disrupt nerve impulses. So again, this is this kind of balancing act between getting too much sodium, too little sodium. High salt diets are associated with high blood pressure and with bloating, associated with if you have decreased salt intake, especially if you have high blood pressure. It can reduce your blood pressure, but many studies show it does not decrease the risk of heart disease or of death. So there are various kinds of descriptions of the dangers of salt, and you don't want to take it too far ahead of what the data are. It does have a significant impact, it appears, on blood pressure, but it doesn't cause or doesn't isn't at least associated with a decrease in the risk of heart disease if you reduce salt. So the big question always for these things is what we refer to as cause and effect. Can you say with a level of certainty that an excess of salt <clears throat> is causing a particular condition? Sometimes that may be the case. We have some good data indicating that for high blood pressure, but we don't for other things associated with salt, like other aspects of heart disease and death. Low salt intake can have some negative effects, and we have to be mindful of that. Increased levels of blood cholesterol and triglycerides, fatty substances in the blood don't get regulated as well if you are having low salt. Also, resistance to insulin occurs. The hormone insulin is the hormone that's responsible for transporting sugar from the blood into the cells. And if you don't have enough salt in your system, um, you can't make that transfer happen as efficiently. So we always think of these kinds of things, and we'll do the same as we talk about sugar and about alcohol, uh, this kind of balancing out. Act on, it may be less so for alcohol, but it's certainly... So for sugar and for salt, we'll see that. So what happens if you eat too much salt? There are some short-term signs. Let's say you just have a huge salty meal in a, in a, on a particular day, or you eat a lot of salt during the day in your food. You're simply gonna retain a lot of water. You may have a rise in some blood pressure measures um, during the, the time of the day that you're, that you're ingesting more than you should have been salt. You'll be more thirsty, you'll drink more, and you'll urinate more. Long-term, though, that is where salt can be harmful when you ingest too much, and that has to do with high blood pressure, uh, with kidney dysfunction, and more recently, there is the possible risk of stomach cancer, although that is not uh, as clear. And it's associated with, but again, not clear that there's a cause and effect relationship. We just know there is a relationship uh, with heart disease and with premature death, with dying earlier than you otherwise might. If you have kidney disease or congestive heart failure, your threshold for negative effects is reduced. That is, it doesn't take as much salt for it to have its impact on you when you already have these kinds of vulnerabilities. So you need to be cautious of that so that even though we are going to see some recommended levels of salt intake, 
those levels may be too high for individuals who already have certain vulnerabilities. Can you compensate for a salt overdose in a meal if you've had a really significant amount of salt in a meal? You know, the, not many things you can do. You can drink a lot of water. So you, you um, try to get the balance back uh, in your fluids um, and eat foods that have hot, more potassium, fruits and vegetables, for example, uh, and then stop doing that. <laughs> Don't do it anymore. So try to manage your salt uh, better. So then the question is, how much is the right amount? Urine sodium levels from 100,000 people in 18 countries have been measured recently in a study. And the data have become clearer and clearer. It's simply that higher sodium is linked very significantly to higher blood pressure. Consuming more than seven grams of sodium per day provides a much higher risk of heart disease and early death than for individuals who consumed only three to six grams of sodium per day. Now remember, these are correlational studies. They aren't able to prove cause and effect. We'd have to do a very long prospective study. We'd have to do a very careful study in which we provided individuals seven grams and other groups of individuals only three and six and followed them in very controlled kind of conditions because it may be that there are some other things that individuals who ingest more salt are doing in addition to ingesting more salt that is contributing to their heart disease and early death. So we don't have those kinds of studies, but those are the kinds of things that we need to do. All we have right now is the understanding that there's a relationship between the two. And given that, it's probably wise to cut down your salt because we don't know exactly what the critical variable is, but we do know that a salt level is associated with it. So a cautionary note, but wisdom tells us um, that it's likely that salt has placed, uh, plays some role. It's estimated that your body actually needs only, this is a remarkable number, only 186 milligrams per day to function. Now we ingest way, way, way more than that. But 186 milligrams, it turns out, is, is hard to measure. We, you can't walk around trying to measure those kinds of things. We don't carry those devices around with us. And so the clinical field and healthcare field and science fields have all kind of come to an agreement on what they think is about the right amount that we can both measure and, and, and in that way control and that's not too much, doesn't do you harm, but keeps you on the healthy side of all of this. And that measure is about 1500 milligrams per day. Um, that's the accepted recommendation. Now, it's not without some controversy. So for example, the World Health Organization, who suggests that 2000 milligrams a day, uh, instead of one and a half grams, two grams. The American Heart Association also suggests two grams per day. So they're giving you a little more leeway. The challenge is, despite whether it's one and a half grams or two grams, we're nowhere near that. We ingest about double, at least double that. And for most people, it's probably much more. We, on average, Americans consume about 3,400 milligrams per day. Now we have to be cautious other studies show that consuming too little salt may be more deleterious to health than consuming too much salt. And we talked about some of the kinds of things that can happen in terms of uh, neural activity and communication of uh, activity, muscles and cramps and other kinds of things. So we are really stuck in a sense with this kind of Goldilocks solution. We have to figure out what's the what's too much and what's too little, and then stay somewhere in that balance. This salt shaker is probably not the best picture of this because we're 
assuming that the, you would you could assume that you can have the whole salt shaker, but no, that's not the case at all. And so, this is really what you can have. This is what um, about fifteen hundred milligrams per day is going to look like. This is a little less than a, a teaspoonful, but you don't want to be anywhere near a full teaspoonful of salt any longer. At least that's the recommendation. So when we talk about how you could minimize your intake of salt, you might think that just reducing your sodium intake, that spoon that you had, just uh, have only half of that and not the the amount that's in there but it turns out it's not so easy it doesn't really work that way tossing out the salt shaker doesn't do it why because as we now understand the main source of sodium in our diet is actually processed foods it accounts for over three quarters of what we take in daily in terms of salt so processed foods are, as shown in this uh, illustration here, of this sandwich. It looks like a reasonably not unhealthy sandwich. You have a slice of Swiss cheese. You have two or three slices of a turkey loaf or some kind of turkey in there. Um, and you have some lettuce and you have bread. But each of these products, each of these components actually contains significant amounts of salt in itself. Not salt that you have put on. You haven't salted the sandwich. This is what's in the food that you're purchasing from over the counter. So the bread has 200 milligrams or so. The cheese has over 300 milligrams. The turkey, usually if you look on uh, in the market and you look at uh, packaged meats, uh, just look at the salt, the sodium levels of those things. It's somewhat frightening. You can with a few slices of uh, some of these meats, you will have your entire day's intake of sodium and you haven't even had the bread and the cheese and the lettuce and everything else, and mayonnaise when you put it on or butter or other kinds of things. So as you can note, the least problematic is lettuce. Unfortunately, that's always the way that um, things that we aren't as fond of in some ways um, are the healthiest for us. But here, look, this little small sandwich is over 1400 milligrams of salt. That's essentially our day's intake of salt. And that's only a snack. That's only one meal. We still have two more meals to go. So it's very hard to minimize your salt intake unless you really begin to pay attention to where the salt is in your diet. It's not on the salt shaker. It is some, of course, but it is on all the processed foods. If you're eating in a restaurant, you have lost control of your salt intake. Uh, you have no idea how much salt you're getting, but you can be virtually certain you're getting more salt than you possibly could need. So cut down on restaurant fast food eating, increase magnesium and potassium to lower your blood pressure. How is that? Eat vegetables, again, leafy, le uh, leafy lettuce. Uh, and it's, it's really kind of simple. Just exercise, eat fewer calories, limit alcohol, eat more fruits and vegetables. Simple idea, all right. All right, let's wrap this part of the salt adventure up um, with our little inverted U-shaped curve. So if we think now of this horizontal axis as salt intake, we're over the left hand side is small amounts and over the right hand side are large amounts. You can see how this makes sense now. We know there's really an optimal level of salt intake. That's somewhere in the range of one and a half to two um, grams of salt. But many people have less than that, and most people have more than that. So we're not having the optimal outcome in terms of health. We're having an outcome that's based around an excessive use of salt, and that's a less than optimal health outcome. Over on the left-hand side, these are just reminders of the things that do matter and help. 
getting enough sleep, of course, exercise, moving, drink plenty of water, stay hydrated. It's one of the ways you can at least counteract to some extent a, a bad salt day. Manage your salt. We know now some of the things to be able to do to do that effectively. Processed foods, restaurant eating, those are the real dangerous areas. Reduce inflammation in your diet. Alcohol in moderation or not at all. We're going to come back to alcohol in just a bit. And then, look, we are still in the midst of a pandemic. So you have to keep in mind those fundamentals that we have learned over the last two years, social distancing, mass and hygiene, when you're in close spaces with people that you don't know and you don't know where and what their uh, experiences and contacts have been. So you have to just be mindful all the time of this. It's a habit. These are all habits that we're talking about. And uh, as you know, uh, this is presented by Map Habit, and this is the website, www.maphabit.com. I encourage you to go to the website to help you develop the idea of habits and why they're so important. We have focused this company on individuals who have cognitive challenges, cognitive impairments, whether they're developmental ones or age-related ones. Um, but the reality is developing a habit is good for all of us and map habit can help you, uh, help you do that. This is the, uh, kind of optimal range that we're talking about in terms of salt intake, one and a half to two milligrams, two grams rather of salt. So, all right. All right. We're going to shift then to sugar. So 10% of our daily calories is what we should be getting perhaps with sugar. Now that would be about six teaspoonfuls or um, 25 grams if we were measuring it carefully, but we actually consume about 20 teaspoons of sugar a day, not six teaspoons, 20. Now, what does that look like? I'm gonna show you this little illustration. Watch this and we can count it out together. We can't hear each other, but you can count along with everybody else who's counting. Here it goes. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Twenty teaspoons of sugar. Now think about if you actually put those into that cup, could you then ingest all of those teaspoons of sugar? It would be almost un impossible for you to do. But it turns out we do it in processed foods and drinks. That's on average what we're in ingesting if you drink um, um, sodas and other kinds of drinks. You've got a lot of sugar intake. It's lurking in lots of processed foods and lots of condiments and lots of drinks. Even foods that you might think are pretty healthy, things like granola bars and cereals. Look at the content of cereals. It's great, fun exercises in the grocery store. Just go to the cereal aisle and look at the amount of cereal per serving that's in sugar, in, in, in cereals. Mostly they're sugar cereals. Occasionally you have a brand of cereal that has really significantly reduced sugar. But for the most part, cereals really have a very high sugar level. So you need to take into account all of the added sugar. It's not just you taking a spoon of sugar and putting it into your coffee. Again, just as in the case of um, salt, it's not so much what we do directly, it's what we ingest through the process of daily living, essentially. So we don't know about added sugars. So here are 12 reasons why too much sugar is not so good for you. It can obviously cause weight gain. You can increase the risk of heart disease. It's linked to acne if you are a youngster. Um, that's a more important problem than if you're an oldster. 
but it does increase the risk of type 2 diabetes, and that is an important challenge for us no matter what our age, but especially as we get older. It can enrich the, increase the risk of cancer, may increase the risk of depression. It can accelerate skin aging, and it can increase your cellular aging, uh, aging of your cells and the abil their ability to function. It drains your energy. We always think of sugar as an energy drink, but it has this immediate impact and then the slow draining of your energy that otherwise wouldn't have happened if you didn't have this big bolus of sugar. It can lead to a fatty liver and it's linked to kidney disease and dental problems, gout, cognitive health risks, all kinds of things are linked to sugar. Now, again, we're always in the same question of cause and effect, but here we have some good and powerful relationships between sugar and health problems. This is the kind of habit loop of sugar. You eat sugar because you like it and you crave it, and it begins to develop some addictive properties. You really in a sense need, you have a physiological need for sugar. It becomes a sugar addiction and this is its perpetual cycle. So you eat the sugar, your blood sugar levels rise, dopamine is released that provides you a sense of satisfaction and enjoyment. Um, that's part of the addiction because you want to get that sense of satisfaction. It also induces insulin secretion. And then shortly after that, blood sugar levels begin to fall and they fall pretty rapidly after the sugar has done its, its biological thing and linked to um, some of the other biochemistry in the brain. Then these insulin levels begin to fall. Um, you have fat storage begins you have your body begins to crave sugar high, not the sugar per se, but the feeling of the sugar. That's why this dopamine release is so important in the cycle because you come to crave that feeling associated with the dopamine release. And then that brings us around to the left side of the curve where you have hunger and cravings for sugar. You have low blood insulin and your appetite cycle begins to be repeated. And so what do you do? You go and you eat sugar back to the top of the circle. And it's just a vicious perpetual cycle that happens. And that's the nature of the sugar habit. Um, we usually think of addiction in other ways with drug addiction, but in this sense, sugar really has the same kinds of mechanisms as alcohol addiction or other kinds of drug addiction, um, the same brain chemistry is involved in the reinforcement of these habits and your a need to continue to do the behavior over and over again. Now, why does it matter? It matters because we know something about our blood sugar levels and cognition. This little illustration in the upper right simply shows that when your blood sugar levels are very high, that's the bad news. Scores on memory tests decline as blood sugar control worsens as you increase your sugar intake. Your ability to function as well on cognitive tests decreases. It's a Harvard 15-year study which showed that individuals who consume 25% or more of their daily calories from added sugar are more than two times as likely to die from heart disease as those consuming only 10% of their calories from sugar. So just enhancing your sugar intake really provides health risks that are significant for us. Now, just one 24 ounce soft drink can cause an average 15 point bump in your systolic blood pressure. That's the top number of the pressure during a heartbeat. And a 
jump in nine diastolic points. That's the bottom number in blood pressure. Um, and that's the pressure between heartbeats. All of those things should be lowered, not raised. You do raise them in a moment of excitement or fear or other kinds of things that happen, but not as a result of drinking soft drinks. That's not what you want to be the case. Um, and that is not an unusual event in teenagers' lives, for example. They drink an enormous amount of soft drinks. And so they really are setting themselves up in many ways for these kinds of vulnerabilities. Now, there is good news about sugar. And the good news is we actually need sugar. It's not that we could just get rid of it. No, we need sugar, but not too much sugar. We need sugar because it's the fuel that runs our brain cells and our other body cells. We need sugar. It is an energy source. The risk of Alzheimer's tumbles down as blood sugar dips. If we lower our blood sugar level, it turns out individuals who over long periods of time had lower blood sugar levels, they were less vulnerable to Alzheimer's for a much longer time than individuals who had higher blood sugar levels. Low saturated fat, low sugar diets, these all reduce the odds of diabetics getting Alzheimer's disease by normalizing insulin levels. They, they help maintain the appropriate insulin levels. Brain levels of amyloid have dropped by 25% in individuals who lower their blood sugar levels. Now, again, amyloid is certainly one of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. We know that when we see patients in the first stages of Alzheimer's disease, they already have abnormal deposits of amyloid. Amyloid is just a protein in the brain. And it's an important protein. It's needed for various things. But when it comes out of control as a result of high blood sugar levels or, or other kinds of genetic aspects associated with uh, levels of amyloid, um, then uh, things bad begin to happen. So the bottom line is you want to try to have a level in your blood of sugar that's good enough to sustain you, but not enough to harm you. All right, I'm going to repeat that again. I'm just going to show this new scale here. So we want to really be on the low side of the sugar intake, not the high side. So good enough to sustain us, but not enough to harm us. That's the Goldilocks framework once again. Here are some of the amounts of sugar that are in some common things that we may be ingesting without thinking very much about how much sugar really is in there. And these are all things that are touted as more or less health foods, uh, cliff bars, some of these bars have five teaspoons of sugar in them. This dark chocolate, we know dark chocolate is supposed to be good and healthy for us. It may help with depression and some other things. But the reality is you'd have to eat so much dark chocolate to have a therapeutic effect that you'd weigh several hundred pounds more um, as a result of it. And then you'd be depressed because you're so overweight. So dark chocolate is not the answer. It's delightful to have, but it's not the answer to depression. Just uh, whole grain black bread still has a lot of sugar in it. And so do all of these things. So the notion is to disrupt the habit loop. We want to reduce our intake. We want to reduce our intake slowly. We don't want to go cold turkey on this. We want to drink more water. Dehydration can mimic hunger. So we, we, we want to make sure we are hydrated and aren't fooled that we're hungry because we don't have enough fluid in our body. And then we want to look for hidden sugars in foods. Start reading food labels. Just look at these items over on the right-hand side. Uh, you can probably intuit pretty much which ones have more sugar or less sugar. Um, but 
we already have this done for us. Every time you pick up any product in the market, it's going to have a food label. It's going to tell you about the sodium level, the sugar level, whether it's added sugars versus sugars that are inherent in the food. Some foods obviously have sugars inherent in them, but many foods, add, many products add sugar to them in addition so that it tastes better and, and people like it more and they become a little more addicted to it. The companies want you to continue to buy their products, so they want to make them as tasty as they can. You want to exercise more. That boosts endorphins. It makes you happier. It actually creates that kind of uh, dopamine feeling and reinforcement. Um, and you only need 15 to 20 minutes on a walk, for example, to raise your endorphin levels and to feel good. Um, it is important to know that you don't have to run a marathon or you don't have to run a half marathon or you don't have to run a 5K. You just have to walk for 15 minutes a day and you don't have to actually be a speed demon on it. You just have to get your steps in. We have so much good data now on individuals and how healthy just walking is. And you can just measure by your steps. Individuals who get 4,000 steps a day in, not hard to do. Um, those individuals have a much lower risk of death. They live for longer periods of time. And if you can move from 4,000 to 7,000 or 10,000 steps a day, 10,000 steps sounds like a lot. It's not a lot, really. It's a couple of miles, three miles. Um, and you can get some of that in as you're doing your chores and things. You don't have to go out onto a track or um, go walking in a purposeful way. You just get a lot of things done, you know, park your car a little further away from the entrance to the store uh, or take a walk um, to do things rather than driving to get to a place. So lots of ways that walking really is a panacea for many kinds of conditions that can be positively affected by walk by walking. Don't rely on food to de-stress yourself. Sugar is a perfect comfort food. Everybody knows that. We love it. You know, what's the first thing when you get stressed? You start eating some candy or some other kinds of things. So you shouldn't, uh, yeah, you shouldn't really um, do that. It's not a good idea, I think, to do that. Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't realize that was still on camera. <laughs> All right, that was just a... I do little dramatic kinds of things as we go through these talks. All right, so naturally sweet whole foods, no added sugar, and these things have a ton of nutrition associated with them. And you can pick out those nutritious things in the, in the illustration, I'm sure. Why did the baker stop making donuts? He just got tired of the whole thing. He had heard this lecture. All right, final slide on uh, sugars. Behaviors, um, again, that matter and need to be habits. Decreasing sugar intake is one of them. Here we are back to our inverted U-shaped curve. Now we have the horizontal axis is sugar intake. We have some optimal levels for that. We have to balance it out. We want to make sure we're not getting a lot of added sugars uh, because that is going to disrupt lots of things. We want to get enough sleep. We want to exercise, keep moving regularly, drink plenty of water. We know about hydration. And now manage your sugar. That's the important thing. Reduce inflammation, alcohol again. We're going to be talking about that next. And keep in mind, just as about 10 minutes ago, we are still in this pandemic. It hasn't stopped in the last 10 minutes. So be mindful of that. And maphabit.com is the place to look for these kinds of things. This is the optimal level of sugar intake. Um, it's going to be in that range that we talked about earlier. So keep that in mind. We'll bring this back uh, at the end. All right, well, let's finish up um, this talk then with our third uh, element, and that's alcohol. 
alcohol and alcohol use. So we need to talk about two things. One is moderate alcohol use, and the other is alcohol use disorder. The National Institute of um, Alcohol and, and um, <laughs> I'm at a loss for this now. I think I had too much of this uh, sugar. See what happens when you have sugar like this? You begin to have challenges. Um, they define heavy drinking as more than four drinks per day for men and more than three drink, drinks per day for women. Women have a, because they're smaller size, smaller weight, um, their intake generally is lower. The Department of Health and Human Services advises that the limit should be two standard drinks for men and one drink for women each day. So just as we had in the salt and the sugar domain, there is no good guideline. Depends on which organization you talk to and talk about uh, in terms of these kinds of uh, substances. A standard drink, everybody agrees on, is a 12 ounce drink of beer, a 12 ounce bottle of beer, or a five ounce glass of wine. It's quite a substantial, actually, glass of wine. And one and a half ounces of hard liquor, 80 proof liquor. So all of these things are about equal in terms of their alcoholic content. And could even this modest amount, if we stuck to having only one of these a day, not one each, of these, but only one of these a day. And that's what happened on a, on a talk I did uh, not, re not just recently, where we show this slide and people said, well, that's not bad. I, but you know, you're not supposed to mix all these drinks like that. I said, no, no, the intent was not that you have one each a day. The intent is you have one or the other of these a day. All right, so let me make that clear. We're really talking about just one serving. Um, and the question then is, could even this modest amount make a difference in our brains? So we have heard lots that one glass of wine or one drink may have some benefit for us in terms of cognitive function. But we're now beginning to understand something slightly different. And lots of people are not going to enjoy this part of the uh, discussion. But it turns out that just one drink a day actually changes your brain. We now have some very good evidence because we have brain imaging and lots of ways we can look inside the brains of living individuals, which we didn't have 20 years ago. We couldn't know the answer to these questions because we couldn't ask the answer. We couldn't ask those questions, but now we can. So just one drink a day may actually change your brain. A study that's done with <coughs> over 36,000 healthy adults in the UK. And the average range of age was 40 to 69 years of age. They looked at the weekly alcoholic consumption and they adjusted for differences in age and sex and height, socioeconomic status, <clears throat> country of residence, etc. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. And here is the finding. This is what I usually have, not the, not the ice cream. Here's the finding. As a person's alcohol intake increased, their gray matter volume, the, the neurons in the brain, and the white matter volume, which is the brain fibers that connect the neurons, both of those things decreased. And that was worse the more weekly drinks they had. So even though they had only one drink a day, they could all, the scientists <clears throat> and clinicians could already detect changes in the gray matter and white matter of the brain in which they were in the reduced volume age. It's not that they were enhanced in some way, they actually were reduced in volume. <clears throat> this replicates earlier findings 
But keep in mind, this is only correlational. We don't know if it proves cause and effect. Does it prove that alcohol creates this? <coughs> Sorry, pause for one minute. <coughs> Thanks. All right. So we need to have better longitudinal studies. Remember we talked earlier about longitudinal studies where you have groups of individuals that you follow for a long period of time under much more controlled conditions. It would be great if we had such studies. Well, it turns out we are now getting such studies. And those studies are suggesting that, yep, it really is the case that just one drink a day actually is having a not good impact on our brains. Researchers could see the difference between brain images of people who never drank alcohol and those who drank just one drink or even two drinks a day. And they could already detect changes in the gray matter and the white matter. This is a study that was published just this year going from one unit of alcohol, one of those drinks, either it was the bottle of beer or the glass of wine or the hard liquor, just a, about a pint of beer, going from one unit of alcohol was linked to changes that look similar to two years of aging in the brain. So the brains changed in ways that made it look like the brains were older than they actually were. Other than comparing the changes in aging, it's not clear what else these findings mean. We need more research in this domain. We haven't had it, and I'll say something in a moment about that. Still, the findings give pause to whether the national guidelines are the best advice to follow, that we can have one drink or two drinks a day with impunity. That may not be the case. The National Institute of Health for some years developed a plan to study that very question because this has been the issue. We don't truly know how harmful alcohol is. We know large doses and if you're addicted to alcohol, that's very harmful, no question about that. <clears throat> but the question is, is moderate drinking harmful? And the sense is probably not very much, but we don't really know the answer to it. Uh, and it could be that it is. And now data starting to suggest it might be the NIH tried to do that study some years ago. They really mounted a multi-million dollar study to ask that very question. And it turned out, unfortunately, the researchers themselves in some cases were connected to the alcohol industry in ways that were both perceived as conflict of interest and probably in real life were conflicts of interest. It wasn't just perception in some cases. Um, and so the NIH actually stopped the study. It just was about to begin and they canceled multi, multi millions of dollars that had been developed for this study because there was a sense of a credibility gap now as to how the results of that study would be interpreted given that there were unusually close links to the alcohol industry by some of the individuals who were selected to do the, the studies and investigation. So that study has never gone on and we never found out the answer it now looks as though individual research units have done some of that work and are finding that there may be some reasons to think that it's probably not such a good idea to have even one drink. Too early, way too early to know the answer to this, but something to be mindful of and to keep in mind in terms of that. Now, heavy drinking by teens can affect brain fiber integrity. We have some good data. That's one of those studies that I mentioned that 
people or uh, groups are starting to do on their own. Uh, this is one of those. Teen drinking is really a terrible thing. And as we know, it can have really dreadful, dreadful consequences. Um, and it's a hard thing to manage if you're a parent uh, to know what the balance is. How do you manage the Goldilocks aspect of drinking with teenagers? Not, a, not an easy question. But we do know something now about what happens to their brains. And this is not just moderate drinking. This is really heavy drinking because it turns out we begin to understand that many teens drink a lot more than we ever supposed they drink. Um, over here on the lower right-hand side under the picture is an important finding from this study. <clears throat> and that is when questioning teens <clears throat> or anyone else about their alcohol use. Ask the question, how much alcohol do you drink instead of do you drink alcohol? Because individuals are generally more willing to answer the first question than they are the last question, the second question. <clears throat> you can engage them in conversation with the first question. And the second question usually is simply said as no, and you get no way to really get a better answer. <clears throat> but uh, asking how much alcohol do you drink Teenagers, it turns out, are much more willing to talk to you about that. All right, well, this study that is illustrated over here on the left-hand side involved 451 participants aged 20 to 21. They were studied for four years. We followed the, uh, the researchers followed these individuals for four years. 37% of them remained at low to no drinking category. <coughs> 21% were classified as heavy drinkers for at least two consecutive visits during the course of the study. <clears throat> Sorry about this. This is the um, pollen time of year here in, um, in Atlanta doing this. And the pollen count, connect, the pollen count today was just way overboard. So <clears throat> I apologize for my dry throat here. Heavy drinkers exhibited significant reduction of whole brain white matter. The brain imaging that uh, was done was more pronounced in younger than older adolescents. The disruption was not present in early visits and it occurred only after the onset of drinking. So here's the really important piece of this. This is for the first time where we can say we have a longitudinal study because we have baseline before individuals started drinking in the study. And then we have what happened subsequent to their drinking in the study. So we have a before and after assessment that brings us pretty close to causality to being able to say with certainty the onset of drinking is what changed the brain. Now we have one other study um, to look at, and that is white matter defects in alcohol use disorder. These are individuals who really are addicted to alcohol and they have become abstinent. They have <clears throat> stopped their alcohol. And the question is what happens to their brains? It, it turns out that there was sustained demyelination even for six weeks or longer once they stopped drinking. The effects on the brain continued as if they were drinking. <clears throat> Eventually those effects slowed down. But the important point is that just stopping for a bit of time is not gonna be sufficient to impact in a more positive way the effects of alcohol. So the point simply is don't, don't do it. <clears throat> One last point, because this became a issue during the COVID, early part of the COVID um, experience that we were having. <clears throat> and the notion to understand here is that drinking alcohol, even a lot of it, 
will not protect you from COVID-19, all right? That is not a useful way to protect yourself. In fact, the opposite is more likely. Excessive drinking is going to weaken your immune system capability as well as your cognition um, and just about everything else. So uh, although alcohol sales shot up about 55%, um, in the first March of the uh, month of March in the um, pandemic, um, alcohol itself was not an effective uh, uh, intervention for reducing your vulnerability for, uh, for um, COVID. So if you drink, keep it to a minimum. Don't be drinking to prevent uh, COVID. This um, little illustration on the right hand side right under me is um, about as simple as it gets. The more your blood alcohol concentration, actually, let me see if I, I don't think I can move my screen here, but as your blood alcohol concentration raises, your impairment raises. And that's true for everything. It's, it doesn't matter whether you're doing a cognitive problem, whether you're driving, uh, whether it's sexual behavior, more alcohol on board, the more impaired you will be. So, fast joke before we stop bacon and eggs, walk into a bar and they order a beer because we're talking about alcohol. Bartender says, Sorry, we don't serve breakfast. I'll let you think about that for a moment and then you'll smile. All right, here's our last uh, slide then. Again, the inverted U-shaped function for alcohol intake. That's on the horizontal axis now, and we know suboptimal versus excessive versus optimal. Now this curve is a little different because we don't actually know if there is an optimal level. Optimal may be zero alcohol in the end. It may take 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years to convince people of that, but it could turn out to be that way. So again, just to remind you, get enough sleep, exercise, drink plenty of water, manage your stress, reduce inflammation and alcohol in moderation or possibly not at all. Social distancing, masking, hygiene, all of those things still in place. Uh, every time we look at this, that hasn't changed. And maphabit.com, that's the place to be um, for helping to develop habits. This is the optimal possibility from what we have now, but this may actually be the reality, is that um, there is no optimal level. There is just a no level is the best and then anything that you start is going to get you into the wrong side of the curve in the end all right okay um oop, sorry we're going to stop at this point and we will uh, turn it back over to the moderator in just one moment i'll just say that um if you're on the mailing list, uh, you will get electronically this uh, slide. This has um, the questions about alcohol and salt and sugar, each of them, uh, with um, the best kind of information we have uh, about each of those substances. All right, so thank you. We will turn it back over to the moderator now, and I will be ready for questions. All right, and there we are. Let me stop my share here. There we are. Welcome back, Dr. Zola. Thank you, Tom. I'm right glad now, to be back in a non-pollen infested environment. <laughs> We've had some good rain here, so it's a, oh, good. actually an easy day to talk. And I do uh, apologize I again for, for the uh, challenge that I had there. I was over at uh, a little family barbecue and we had uh, jasmine just exploding in the backyard. And it's one of the few things that really takes me down that way. So I was feeling for you 
throughout the presentation. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We yep. should have tried to re-record it, but there were no days that were uh, going to be non-pollen days in the horizon. So there was no, no, no worries. Yep. Great. So, uh, you know, with the uh, alcohol uh, content, uh, as I got older, uh, of course, I stopped processing alcohol the way I did in my 20s and, and 30s and things. And it, in my late 30s, I was like, this just isn't working for me no matter what I do, you know. Uh, and so it just made me turn my back on it. And, and uh, uh, I think now seeing this, <laughs> this presentation, I think... Uh, move. <laughs> exactly. In my, my body's inability to really process it the way it used to probably uh, is, is saving my brain and a lot of uh, wear and tear on my body. Yeah. Possible there. I see we have a hand or two raised. Do we want to try and grab All right. This? One second here. Let me see if I can check that off here. Tell me about that. Ah, here we go. Let's see. We have Jerry who has, Jerry and Charlotte, uh, you'll have to hit your uh, unmute button yourself there uh, if you can. Had a hand raised. That might have been involuntary. At the bottom of your screen, you can hit the unmute button. Jerry and Charlotte. Cooper, if you have a question you'd like to ask live. I apologize. It was an error. Oh, no problem. All right, Jerry. Thanks. Great to hear from you. <laughs> I was actually trying to move it. <laughs> All right. No worries. It's not always uh, easy to unraise your hand in, uh, in Zoom, which, which is a little bit of a, of a problem. So does any, if anybody has any uh, uh, questions, we have the Q&A open, ask there. Um, we've got nothing in the chat and, uh, and no questions in okay. the Q&A now. If you have any allergy tips for Dr. Zola, let us know there too. But I think we are out of questions. Yeah, we may have run our, uh, our time out here with this one. Let me just say one other thing and reiterate this a little bit, because for all three of these, whether we're talking about salt or sugar or alcohol, it really is a challenge to try to be able to do the critical studies. First of all, it's almost impossible to do one study that is going to answer all the questions, but even to complete a study that answers one kind of question, it's very difficult to do as you <clears throat> can begin to understand. It really means that you have to have a lot of individuals, first of all, enrolled in the study, and you have to randomize those individuals in a way that is a true randomization so that the characteristics of the control group and the characteristics of the experimental group are really quite identical in order to be sure that you haven't biased the outcome in one way or another. And then you have to spend some time examining what it is that you're examining and assessing that um, to find your answer. So these kinds of studies are just very challenging in general. And we face this uh, right during this pandemic. We did a really, uh, science and medicine did a remarkable job at being able to get the studies with control groups of individuals and individuals who had a particular vaccine trial on a particular vaccine trial to be able to prove or demonstrate with some level of certainty that the vaccine actually was having its impact in the way that uh, has been reported. Uh, but those trials are really hard to do. Uh, we're much better at it now, given the experience we've had over the last three years about how to get some of these things done much more quickly than we used to understand how to do. But even then, these are daunting kinds of things to get right and get completed. So. 
Um, each time I do one of these talks, I try and hope, uh, try and hope to be able to inform all of us about what a challenge these things really are. To be able to say something with certainty based around all of this research um, is really a hard thing to do. And so it's not surprising that you see all the time uh, changes in policies or changes in the way, for example, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, um, was often being lambasted in the, in the media for changing uh, their points of view, but they changed their points of view because they began to develop the newest data and those newer data then led them into a new conclusion about how safe or not safe certain kinds of activities were or masking and non-masking, et cetera. So there's no easy answer for these things. And we just have to be able to be tolerant to live with a lot of uncertainty in our lives. And it's true for most of the things we just talked about. I think alcohol is probably the best example of that. We truly don't know at this point um, where we should stand in terms of advice about alcohol. It just is a hard, hard question to answer. Uh, lots of um, things pulling from each side uh, in terms of what they'd like the answer to be. Um, but it's going to take some time before we really know. The same was true for cigarettes. I think probably it's a great example where for the longest time, the sense was that cigarette smoking is just fine. And after some long, long, long periods, several decades, it took for people to start to understand how harmful it really was. And so we may see the same thing for salt, for sugar, for alcohol, for other kinds of substances. It takes a long time to understand these things. So I'll stop there and just leave. Oh, we, we had a question come in. Oh, please then go ahead. Uh, there. And uh, Scott asks, where do sugar substitutes fit in? Uh, so sugar substitutes really become a double-edged sword in themselves. Uh, they can be very useful and good um, by reducing your sugar and having a more natural uh, uh, course for sweetening that doesn't have some of the characteristics that um, sugar has. But uh, again, there's some indication at least that for some of these sweeteners, um, they also may have some kinds of side effects that we hadn't anticipated uh, and still have to be cautious about. So um, I think again, the jury in many ways is still out on many of these kinds of questions. Uh, and uh, I wish I could be more concrete about it, but that's the uh, unfortunate uh, reality here of, of where we are. I will say some of the nutritional doctors that I work with, uh, they are talking about things like stevia as close to the plant as you can, being yes. a great sugar substitute, as well as monk fruit. Uh, and just making sure that it's not processed the same way that we're processing so many of these uh, other sweeteners uh, because once those two items are processed by kind of the big sugar and sugar substitute companies, uh, they lose their uh, benefit. So, uh, yeah, as close yeah. to the plant as you can get. And those are really good substitutes. Good. Good. All right. Anything uh, uh, else for us? Nope. I think we I think we've covered it all. And uh, yeah, and we will see everyone next month. And thank you so much for a great All right, I look forward to it. And hopefully the pollen season will be over by then and yes. we'll be able to uh, be back peppy and not uh, coughing all the time. <laughs> Excellent. All right, good. everyone take good care. Thank you, everybody. Bye.